this is my starting point. Uh, the Swedish scholar David Tyrfjell has just published another study of how secular societies still bear traces of religious feelings. And in this book, he tells a story when he goes to Swedish school, second grade, children seven or eight years old, he talks about the Norse gods. And suddenly girls say, why don't we invent a god so we can have something to revere? So they conjure up uh, Gulbert. Gulbert is the name of their god. And he's riding on a pig and he has a yellow pencil as a kind of magic wand. Now, David Tulfia likes to complicate the things. So he said, what happens if children from another school comes to your classroom and they take the pencil and they spit on it? And one of the boys comes up with the solution, we will kill them. Now imagine this in secular Sweden, eight year old boy is prepared to fight for and maybe even die for a pencil that is just a product of his fantasy. This shows the power of the, the icon, letters, pictures, images, etc. And this is what we're going to explore today with Daniel Reynolds. So now with this heartly welcome. Thank you very much. So Byzantine iconoclasm rarely fails to spark the imagination. And in part, I suspect that this is due to the perennial appeal of the icon as one of Byzantium's most enduring cultural symbols. It is often through the icon that many of us first encounter this empire as rows of gleaming sacred images in museums or Orthodox churches. And they appear to us as timeless because such is their intent. The idea then that at one time such images were contested continues to underlie our fascination with the period of Byzantine iconoclasm. Now iconoclasm is a visceral term. For those of us born or educated within the European Protestant tradition, it all too readily conjures up popular images of the Reformation or the French Revolution, of defaced statues, smashed stained glass, violence and occasionally death. Byzantine iconoclasm, as we will see, has very little in common with these more recent iconoclastic episodes. But the issues raised during the 150-year period of the dispute about the relationship between the image and prototype, about the control of history and the power of memory, and about the power of the image itself, have relevance today. And nowhere is this clearer than in recent episodes of iconoclasm in the UK and the USA directed at statues associated with the history of slavery. And these have once more raised essential questions. What is exactly being attacked here? Is it the materiality of the image itself, its artistic or its economic value? Is it the person, the institution, the idea that the image is held to embody? And are the actions of the iconoclasts morally justifiable? or are they reprehensible? Theories of iconoclasm offer us no clear-cut solutions to these issues, but they force us to think beyond the image itself and into more existential questions about the values that we hold as individuals and as a society, about the power struggle inherent within the definition of memory and what history is, and into the relationship between the image and its prototype. Iconoclasm also reminds us that even today, when global literacy now stands at 87%, the power of the image in this world will not be easily supplanted. Byzantium was the first European society to effectively battle with these questions, and the debates that were first set out in the empire between 720 and 843 still hold valuable lessons today. But to understand how the Byzantines viewed this period also requires something of a caveat. The combined term Byzantine iconoclasm did not exist until the 1950s. Byzantium, as many of us know, is a 16th century term to describe the medieval Roman Empire, which existed in various forms until the fall of Constantinople to the Ottomans in 1453. The Byzantines, however, never ceased to consider themselves to be Roman. Iconoclasm, con con concocted from two Greek words, ikon, image, klastis, breaker, did not fully make its way into English until the 19th century. The Byzantines themselves referred to this period as iconomarchy, the battle or struggle for images. 
a term which is less focused on the act of destruction and more about the question on the role of images within Christian worship. So partly our need to equate Byzantine iconoclasm with destruction lies in the cultural baggage that we have inherited since the 16th century. But it also owes much to the perceptions of the victorious image supporters, the iconophiles, who rewrote the history of the struggle after 843 and ensured the denigration of the memories of their opponents, the iconoclasts. And that legacy is still to be seen today in the slanderous nicknames assigned to iconoclast emperors like Constantine V, the Copronimos, named after dung, or in the illuminated Byzantine manuscripts like this, in which iconoclasts are likened to the soldiers who taunted Christ on the cross. But in terms of evidence for actual image destruction, we possess very little. Indeed, a church council held by iconoclast clergy prohibited the removal of images from churches without express imperial consent. Only a single example, which may be linked to an official decree, is documented in contemporary sources. And this occurred in Constantinople in the Secreton, which was an audience chamber in the great church of Hagia Sophia. Now, during the 760s, the patriarch Nicetas is said to have ordered a series of mosaic panels depicting Christ and the saints to be removed from this chamber. Traces of image removal, which still relate to this episode, are still to be seen in the upper register of the wall. And in this case, disruption to the mosaic tessera beneath the, the depiction of two crosses reveals the former existence of inscriptions which once named the holy persons depicted in the roundel. But clearly these images were erased sensitively and they show that Byzantine experiences of iconoclasm were very different from more recent understandings of the term. So how did the Byzantine struggle over images come about? Well, Byzantine concerns over religious images did not fully emerge until the 8th century, but the use of images within Christianity predated the iconoclast dispute by centuries. Now, Christianity became the dominant religion within the Roman Empire around about the late 4th century, and images featuring portraits of holy people appeared around about this time. But in this early period, their purpose was purely commemorative. Divine power was sought through relics. It was not until the 7th century that icons, as we now understand them, were ascribed a similar status to relics in their ability to transmit the presence of a holy saint. Now, the earliest clear description of this power dates to the late 7th century. And this is a text known as On the Holy Places, which was written by Adam Nan, the abbot of Iona, an island off the coast of Scotland. And the text preserves a story from Constantinople. And the story relates how a man who was about to set off for war stood before a portrait of the holy confessor George and prayed for deliverance from the dangers of that war. This story represents the earliest documented case where an icon is described as having borne the ever presence of a saint and being revered in a manner that had previously only been reserved for relics. The man is described as having spoken to the image and the confessor George, ever present in his icon, responded by ensuring his safety. Such a radical shift in the status accorded to icons responded to several changes in the empire in the 7th century. The 7th century was a period of perpetual crisis for Byzantium. The Byzantine-Persian War of 602 to 628 inflicted heavy territorial and military losses. By 632, the politically econo and economically depleted empire faced further threats from the Muslim Arab incursions into Byzantine territory following the death of Muhammad. And within a decade, the empire had lost all of its Levantine territories and its Egyptian ones too, and the remaining parts of the empire were subject to repeated military assaults. In this time of crisis, icons emerged as a means through which prayer could be effectively channeled by people in need of divine aid. Contemporary writers often try to explain these crises as a result of God's punishment of Christians. And what one sin that they were particularly worried about was idolatry. But the change in the role of images that had taken place in these difficult times was also met by an immediate institutional response. In 692, a church council was convened in the imperial palace at Constantinople, and it established the first canonical rulings on imagery. 
Canon 82 of the Council issued prohibitions against symbolic images by insisting that all images must represent historic reality. Henceforth, Christ was not to be depicted as a Lamb of God, but to be shown in his fully human form. Now, the rulings of the 692 Council evidently responded to a growing awareness about the power of images, but also the potential danger of abuse. Now, the first instances of anti-image sentiment are not documented until around about 30 years later in the reign of Leo III. Now, while roundly condemned as an iconoclast by later sources, the evidence to link Leo III to an official iconoclast edict remains very limited. The initial opposition to icons actually began life as a grassroots movement within the provincial church. It is first documented in the 720s in two letters from the Patriarch Germanos of Constantinople to a churchman named Constantine who was resident in what is now modern Turkey. In the letters, Constantine rebuked, um, uh, Germanos rebuked Constantine for refusing to bow before images and venerate them and then failing up to uphold church tradition. Now, by the 730s, these ideas had spread much further. A third letter addressed to Thomas of Claudiopolis, also in Turkey, was much stronger in its tone, and it condemned Thomas for having removed icons from his church. These letters indicate, between the 720s and the 730s, the main fault lines between the pro-image and anti-image arguments had already begun to develop. But an official imperial stance was not to be taken until the mid-8th century during the reign of Leo's son, Constantine V. Now, Constantine V's anti-image arguments are not detailed until around about 750 when he wrote a work known as Questions, Pusis. And this work now survives only as fragments in a 9th century refutation, but here are two of them. Now, these two positions were endorsed at a church council at the Palace of Hyrea in 754, which formally banned the production and veneration of icons. And in their place, Constantine advocated for a renewed focus on the Eucharist, the bread and wine of the communion, as the only true image of Christ, and of course, the symbolic importance of the cross. Now, Constantine's anti-image position forced pro-image churchmen to formulate their own defence of images. And among them was the monk John of Damascus, whose three treaties in defence of images were among the most influential works in establishing the main points of icon veneration. Now, much like Constantine V's position, John's defence rested on a combination of Christology, arguments about the nature of Christ, and the power of church tradition. Now, the pro-image positions articulated by John and his contemporaries gained their most coherent form a generation later in the proceedings of the Second Council of Nicaea in 787. The rulings of the 787 Council established the groundwork for the cult of icons, which has remained a central feature of Orthodox Christianity ever since. The practices of kissing icons, performing prostration before them, honouring them with candles or incense can be first traced back to the protocols of 787. Now, the ideas set out in the Iconoclast 754 Horus and the pro-image meeting of 787 were to have lasting implications for the debate over images in the following century. A brief reinstatement of iconoclasm in Constantinople in 815 drew heavily on the iconoclast principles first set out in 754. In 843, when the synod which permanently re-established icons was convened, it also legitimised its position through references to the arguments of people like John of Damascus a century earlier. The level of image destruction linked to the ruling of the iconoclast councils remains highly speculative. But what is clear is the extent to which the eventual iconophile victory in 843 sparked an almost systematic revision of the history of iconomarchy. The ability of the iconophiles to essentially rewrite and control the memory of that struggle and those embroiled within it remains the most enduring legacy of Byzantine iconoclasm. So to conclude, the value of Byzantine iconoclasm today lies less in the physical act of destruction and more about what it tells us about the nature of power and counterpower in our world.
In their emphasis on the leadership of priests and the rituals of the church, the Byzantine iconoclasts effectively sought to enshrine a hierarchy of belief which privileged the institutional, the elite, and the male in human interactions with the divine. In their appeal to the universal senses of sight and touch, the iconophile view championed an alternative relationship that was less hierarchical and centered on an individual's power to commune with his or her creator. It is perhaps not unsurprising that the popular appeal of the image eventually won out. As the destruction of statues in the 21st century also shows, the ability of iconoclasm to shed light on those essential tensions between the institutional and the popular and the power to define memory and history continues to give relevance to those debates over a thousand years later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a, Dan, we have a few minutes for... What is the importance of this discussion in later Christianity? What has been the influence after 1453? Um, it was um, the, the ideas set out were incredibly influ influential during the Reformation as well. Um, on both sides of the argument in terms of the Catholic Church's support for icon veneration, but also as a sort of source material for the basis of the Protestant objection to image veneration as well. But the broader questions have always had, um, have always popped up in terms of trying to understand the, the, the relationship between the image and what it seeks to represent and its prototype, and whether or not when one seeks to venerate or attack an image, what is it are they actually attacking? Is it the physical image itself yeah. made of wood or stone? Or is it the idea or the image behind it? So those ideas were very influential in the 16th century as well. And how does it affect the idea of, of worship then? Well, this is a point of contention. <laughs> so in, um, particularly in terms of pro-image arguments, one of the main um, distinctions which is made is the distinction between veneration and worship. And this is something that John of Damascus particularly is very keen to delineate. The idea that when you venerate an image of the Virgin Mary, you are not worshipping her as a god, you are simply venerating her position within Christianity. And that veneration is directed at the Virgin, not at the wooden object itself. But worship is something which is due to God alone. And that is, a, a, again, a point of contention between both the iconoclasts and the iconophile positions. Is Christianity complicated because God is God and also has, as you told us, her human form? Yes, and this is again one of the, the key points of debate. And iconoclasm and many of its debates is as much about the nature of the incarnation as it is about images themselves. So when John argues um, uh, in defense of images, one of his key arguments is to say um, the, the reason why we can make images of Christ is because he appeared on earth as a human. And so therefore to not make images of Christ is to deny that ever took place, which is a heresy. Of course, the iconoclast viewed that in order, if you depict Christ in his human form, what you are effectively doing is splitting off his humanity from his divinity, which is also a heresy. So this uh, debates about images within Byzantium are as much about this relationship between God the Father and God the Son. And a lot of this, um, I would argue, is also provoked by the emergence of Islam within the Mediterranean, which again makes the issue of the incarnation a very pertinent one in terms of a broader Mediterranean discussion about the divine. So, Thank you for this excellent start and be prepared for taking part in our ensuing panel discussion. Andreas Bingford, and if you want to know more about Andreas, please turn to the back of the program. Welcome, and go ahead. So, good morning. Um, I will talk about some aspects of iconoclasm or destruction of images in ancient Egypt, and more specifically during the so-called Amarna period in the mid-14th century BC, where Akhenaten was the pharaoh who people might know as having introduced a type of monotheistic religion, or at least that's the claim. And with that came new theological ideas, which then caused a wave of iconoclasm. 
And the first image allows us to jump straight into the topic according to the ancient Egyptians. And it shows you the names of Akhenaten's god, the, the Aten. And the god changed names throughout the reign of the king. As his theology radic radicalized, so did his approach to the divine and to the image. And here I should also point out that the king himself changed his name from Amunhotep, Amun is content, to Akhenaten, the one who's beneficent or effective to the Aten. And it has been claimed that um, the name changed, the one you see on the top, because it alluded to the world of the old gods, it did identifying Aten with another solar deity that was tightly connected to the image of a falcon. Also, the feather you see in the second cartouche alluded to a divine couple and therefore a polytheistic world. Uh, and this slide shows you that iconoclasm in Egypt is not only image, it's also text. The script is made up of images. And when we examine this in ancient Egypt, we therefore have to look at both aspect, text and image. Uh, and image in Egypt is also not merely a schematized or a mimetic representation of an object in the real world. It possessed a connection to the referent. And this connection did not primarily lie in the mimetic representation of this object or a person. Instead, it, this person was usually portrayed in a schematic manner and generally took the shape of an idealized image. And the resemblance between image and what it referred to was instead found in shared archetypical characteristics. Thus, a figure with little mimetic resemblance to something in the real world could be taken as possessing qualities of its referent. Here you see a king portrayed as a sphinx, clearly still the sphinx of uh, the king. And through these shared qualities, uh, the destruction of an image was not merely the erasure of a figure, it in fact was harmful for what it depicted and threatened its existence. So killing the image was equally killing its referent. Thinking about Egyptian images and texts in such a way uh, allows us to understand why, for instance, texts uh, in the, were ritually mutilated in the funerary sphere, for instance. And what we see here is an inscribed coffin, and the mutilated figure is simply the word of the word father. And potentially dangerous beings could thus be diffused uh, in such a manner. And this might also explain why Akhenaten took the effort to change the god's name. By mutilating a word, in fact an image, the depicted entity could not be identified with it anymore or put, and also not pose danger. And the same thing applies to two-dimensional and three-dimensional images of objects or humans. One could deactivate a statue of a person by poking out its eyes. One could prohibit the image to breathe by removing nose and mouth. And through doing this, the image could also not get nourishment and be prevented from potential harmful speech. Harmful speech would be uttering evil spells or just invoking evil by mentioning it. And also the extremities of a figure could be um, mutilated, usually hands and feet, in order to prevent the image from moving about and acting. If it was of a named person, the name could be chipped out or changed to show that this person was pariah in society. And what you see here is an example made by a colleague of mine uh, of a in disgraced individual in the Old Kingdom. However, threat to one's image uh, or to imagery was not only motivated by someone's desire to eradicate these people. Neglect and time were also threats to images. Egypt was a highly materialistic culture which did not know the difference between material and immaterial. Conce and concepts that we regard as metaf metaphysical were absorbed by the material world. For instance, stone and metals incorporate the notion of eternity. 
So to live forever, it was important to construct a tomb um, in stone with images in stone and so forth. However, Egypt doesn't not only work according to such simple rules. It was a much more complex society than that. And there existed a discourse of the fragility of the material world, including stone and metals. One text is, or extract of it is shown on the slide, um, and it teaches us that the only way of reaching immortality was through one's actions, which ideally would have, which would then be remembered by generation, preferably by having handed down teachings which would be, uh, or having composed teaching which would be handed down generation to generation. And it appears, in fact, that Akhenaten was inspired by this discourse when he formulated his new solar theology. On the slide, you see the translation of an inscription, quite destroyed, but still, from the early years of the king's reign, where he deliberates the perishable nature of the man-made gods, and thus the Aten had to be different. The Aten was the sun as we see it. And perhaps here we can understand part of the unwillingness of the king to have his god named in such a way that it would allude to the perishable world. Now, this does not mean that Akhenaten was unaffected by the material world. He made sure that his monument, or he claimed that his monument, would stand forever. And at his new capital in Amarna, known as Akhetaten, uh, which was erected as a cult center for his new god, there were provisions made for earthly uh, manifestations of his god in the form of the Mnevis bull. Uh, although the king, quite early on, favored his new eternal god, there seems to have been little effort in the early years to get rid of any other deity. And actually, shortly before he moved to the new capital, he received a missive from the religious authorities in Memphis explaining that the local cults of the other gods are thriving. But after a few years, after the move, the iconoclastic campaign of Akhenaten began, which also includes the change of the god's name. So in what way did this iconoclasm be, how did it get expressed? Well, both texts and images were targeted, primarily those belonging to the god Amun, but also the Theban triad, which besides Amun includes his consort Mut and their son Konsu. And it must have been a gargantuan undertaking. Images of Amun were taken off from Nubia in the south to the Sinai in the east. However, Thebes, the cult center of Amun, was hit the hardest. Often, the whole image of Amun was erased. Not only the god, but also his crowns, his, his scepter, his name, and so forth. Uh, images which were not publicly visible, for instance, on obelisks 30 meters high, were also erased. Uh, I've already mentioned that both names and images of the gods were taken off, uh, at least those which were found. And even the, this campaign was actually so fanatical that the king's first name, Amenhotep, was also erased, at least the first member of the name. When the god appears in the shape in, as a as a, what we call a syncretistic form, amun re both elements could be erased. But also, occasionally, the second member, the sun disk representing Ray, could remain. It was not taken off a monument. However, the terminative of the god, a, a seated divine figure, was quite often erased. And this has been interpreted as, a, as that any reference to an anthropomorphic deity was abhorrent to the new religion. However, considering that a lot of other anthropomorphic deities connected with the sun were largely untouched. The seated figure is perhaps not to be understood in this way, but rather as representing Amun Re and therefore Amun and therefore had to be erased. Anything that could refer to the god had to be taken away. 
The name of his consort, Mut, was erased. Even the hieroglyph representing Mut, a vulture, when that was part of another word, a phonetic as a phonetic complement, it could also be erased. And the same goes with the name of a moon. Words containing the same signs could also be erased, even if it didn't express the word a moon. At Thebes, private tombs were entered and images and names of gods or of a moon was removed. And specifically, the mention of the plural gods were chiseled out. So was this an attempt to rid the country of any, uh, the, uh, the existence of any other god than the Aten? Well, the word is allowed to remain outside of Thebes. For instance, on these commemorative inscriptions um, commemorating the, the foundation of the new city. And also the word goddess is allowed to remain in place quite often. So it has been suggested that the word gods at Thebes was not in fact referring to all the gods of Egypt, just the Th Theban triad. Now, while other, uh, some other gods were also targeted, some of them can be explained by the fact that they have some resemblance to Amun. Khnum was also a ram god. Both gods could be depicted as a ram. Hathor was also um, occasionally erased, just the names, not the images uh, or, or the representation, although. And this is just one example of how this was done. On the other hand, as you saw on a previous slide, uh, the goddess Sachmet, a leonine aspect of Hathor, was allowed to remain next to an image of uh, a moon, which was taken off. So what was Akhenaten trying to achieve? The fact that most other instances of gods were untouched complicates the assumption, I think, that this would have been done as a part of a monotheistic zeal. Um, Amun was not targeted because he and any associated deity were regarded as pagan idols that would distract from, this, distract from the pure and true worship of the Aten. Rather, it has been suggested that the new solar theology of Akhenaten could not tolerate any old forms of solar worships. But there must be more to the story. Certain forms of the old sun cult were allowed to linger on. The cult of Amun was clearly, now that the cult of Amun was regarded as abhorrent and false, could also have affected a lot of other deities in a similar way, but it didn't. Now, and also given Akhenaten's idea about the perishable nature of the material world, merely shutting down a cult would have sufficed to neutralize it. Um, now, in any case, Akhenaten did not succeed. Amun returned after the king's demise and his, the king's one god stopped being worshipped. And he himself became a target for a similar campaign that he had put the Theban god through. It is possible that Akhenaten still reached immortality in Egypt, not through his monuments, however, but through his deeds. That is another story, however. Thank you. Do we know how much Akhenaten was driven actually by religious fervor or if he used religion to, to manifest his power? I think both. I don't think they need to be separated. Mm -hmm. There's clearly a theological idea here that he doesn't believe in the image. And this is before the iconoclasm begins. They construct temples which don't contain a traditional image, mm. it is the sun. And it's only after, in his year eight or nine, that this begins. Um, he, when they, in the stone quarries, for instance, where they took stone for the new uh, temples, they still have inscriptions to Amun, and they were later, later on erased. Mm. So it is, begins at least as a, the, as a theological idea. This kind of destruction resembles to, to voodoo, where you sort of attack the image. Is it as primitive as voodoo, or is it more sophisticated? Now, ah. Well, I think 
there are similarities. There are similarities. But in Egypt, it sufficed to depict something, call it something, and if it was sufficiently similar, you could destroy that. I am not an expert on voodoo, but I assume you don't actually need a physical item from the person you want to target. Mm. And you construct a puppet to destroy it. Here, it, you also have that in Egypt. You can create something and write the name of something and then destroy it and then you also kill it. So there are similarities, obviously, but I would say this iconoclasm is slightly different still. In your, f in your chapter in the forthcoming book, you reveal the secrecy of fertility. Can you... Do I do that? <laughs> a yes, you say there's a hieroglyph for fertility. Oh, yes. And if you scrape the sand from oh, this... Yes. Yeah, tell, tell yes. This. Oh, yes, Let's I'm share the secret of fertility with this right. audience. So, uh, if, if, you, if there were words, for instance, part of the hieroglyphic writing system, which depicts male members, and obviously that's a symbol of fertility, you could scrape that off and ingest it in one way or another to become fertile. fertile. So, yes, that, that's part of it. So, that was in a way, it's that... That's the same mechanism as destroy, destroying an image. You can actually get power from it. With this contribution, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, I hope that Robin Dunbar will appear on the screen. Here you are. Yep, Robin, here I am. Welcome. The next 15 minutes belongs to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let me just uh, share my screen. Uh, and I'm really going to talk about the, some of the underpinnings of uh, what the two previous uh, speakers uh, have been uh, discussing, I think. Um, this essentially the mechanisms that involve community bonding uh, in humans and where they come from. So contrary to uh, what I suspect is everybody's contemporary perspective on society, um, which is something very large and anonymous, um, our real social world is actually extremely small. The, it, it's uh, much more like the picture at the bottom, if you like. Um, and the natural size of human groups is reflected both in our personal social networks and in many aspects of how our world is organized, the world of business and, uh, and religion and all sorts of other aspects of the world, um, seems to uh, come down to a grouping of about 150 people, uh, the, the number that's now known as Dunbar's number, the limit on the number of um, rela meaningful relationships you can have. And this is, reflects the fact that in all small-scale societies, including those of our primate uh, cousins, the central problem of group living is coordination. It's not cooperation. Very often uh, there's a perception that uh, social life is all about engineering cooperation. It's caused a great deal of problems in trying to explain how cooperation could evolve. Um, we've come to realize that actually cooperation is kind of irrelevant. The issue is coordination, how you get everybody on the same page and staying together as they move through the world foraging. And primates achieve that by using bonded dyadic relationships that create a kind of chain integrated network. So a bit like the uh, picture on the bottom right there, um, if you imagine yourself as these black square at the center of the circle, um, you have relationships and relationships with relationships, friends of friends as it were, that fan out through the group as a whole and create a kind of gravitational field that holds the group together. Um, once you have that in place and you have these bonded relationships, which are relationships of obligation and, and trust and so on, cooperation actually comes for free. Um, and indeed all our voluntary, uh, cooperations with each other, uh, are mostly confined to our, our personal social networks, i.e. they occur within that, uh, 150, um, uh, social uh, world that we live in, because those relationships are guaranteed by personal trust and personal uh, sense of obligation. 
um, relationships outside that become transactional. Um, they're, they're the kinds of relationships that economists talk about. In the context of uh, our intimate social world, there is no public good dilemma problem. It simply doesn't arise because everything is guaranteed by trust, as it were. So how do primates create their friendships? It's actually a, what's called a dual process mechanism. It involves two distinct components that use two different uh, pathways, neural pathways in the brain, um, but which work in tandem with each other and, and mutually reinforce each other. One is an emotionally intense component uh, based on social grooming, this, this stuff you can see going on in these two pictures. Um, they, primates spend a, the social primates spend a lot of time um, uh, engaged in this activity, and what happens is that it triggers hand movements across the skin and fur, trigger uh, the release of endorphins in the brain, and it's endorphins in the brain which create this sense of trust and warmth, personal warmth, emotional warmth, if you like, and obligation that create friendships. Uh, and just on the bottom right is some of the original evidence um, showing that um, uh, grooming releases endorphins in, in primates. But my collaborators in Finland um, have used PET scanning to show, show this effect in humans, stroking uh, very light, what's sometimes called soft touch stroking, triggers the release of endorphins in the brain. The second component is a cognitive component um, it's related much more to brain size. It's the context, cognitive co context in which relationships of trust and reciprocity and obligation are built up. Um, in, in the case of monkeys, that's obviously uh, kind of um, mental impressions, if you like. It gets a bit more complicated in humans, as we'll come to in a second. Now, the problem with this touch-based um, form of social bonding, which we still use, we use it all the time in conversations with our uh, close uh, friends and family, um, is that it's very limiting on the number, the size of social groups that can be bonded. And that turns out to be at about 50. And if we're living in groups of 150, um, that clearly creates a problem. And indeed, most of our social time is actually directed to the closest 50 people, the closest family and, and, and friends in our social network. Something like 75% of our social effort, however you measure that, whether it's time or emotional closeness or whatever, emotional capital, 75% uh, uh, of that uh, is devoted to just 50 people. And all the other people beyond that, extending to the entire population of Sweden, I guess, um, gets very little to, uh, of our time on an individual by individual basis. The way we solve that problem is this, and it seems to have happened in three separate stages during the course of the last two million years. One is the introduction of laughter, later the introduction of singing without words, chorusing, if you like, and dancing, and then finally with the evolution of language about a quarter of a million years ago with the appearance of our own species, um, uh, uh, the rituals of religion, feasting, eating and drinking together, and uh, uh, storytelling. Um, and we've shown that all of these trigger the endorphin system. All of them create a sense of belonging to a larger, sometimes more anonymous, not completely, well, it can be quite anonymous, um, but it, it's, allow, it's what's allowed us to build up these much, much bigger groupings beyond that 150 layer. Uh, you might think of it in terms of creating a sense of belonging to a tribe. So who makes a good friend in this context? This is essentially the, the second cognitive component, uh, the thinking part of the story, if you like. Um, and, and the important point about this is that, it, that this is the sort of underlying cognitive uh, aspects of how we choose our friends, but it also provides, uh, it turns out, the basis for creating much, much larger communities? Well, the short answer, uh, as has been discovered, um, really only within the last uh, 15 years maybe, but probably we knew about for the last uh, 200,000 years, in intuitively, is that it's all about homophily. Um, uh, we prefer as our friends people who are very similar to us uh, in a whole range of different ways. This is the birds of a feather flock together phenomenon. Um, now, 
in the present context, what turns out to be really important is actually a bunch of cultural components, which we've uh, referred to as the seven pillars of friendship. Um, and these are like a kind of barcode, if you like, a supermarket barcode of who you are as a person and uh, what community you really belong to. Um, and the seven pillars are having the same language or dialect, uh, coming from the same place. I think that's really much more about where you grew up than where you were born as such. Having the same career trajectory, um, one of the reflections of that is that um, it's well known that lawyers only have lawyers as friends, uh, um, uh, and most of their friends are other lawyers. We always thought that that was because nobody else would be friends with lawyers, but it turns out to be a rather general phenomenon. They've got things to talk about that are of common interest, and that's why they gravitate together. Similarly, having the same hobbies and interests, having the same worldview, which is to say moral view, religious view, political views, and then the two surprising ones, if you like, are having the same musical tastes, tastes and having the same sense of humor. Having the same musical tastes is interesting because they're actually the two factors that have the strongest effect on uh, identifying a possible friend from a complete stranger is actually having the same worldview and having the same musical taste. If you both like the same kinds of music, um, there's the basis of a, a friendship there, no matter who you are. All of these actually identify your community of origin. They seem to identify um, that small group of people within which you learned how to be a member of the community, how to be um, a, a person, if you like, but a particular person immersed in a particular community. And we think this harks back to the fact that in prior to um, uh, Neolithic uh, settlements, when all humans lived as, as hunter-gatherers in these very, very small dispersed groups where the, the grouping size of 150 was the core, core unit, um, this actually identified that core unit because, and they would all have been family. So essentially it's identifying people who you know how you, that you can trust, you know how they think, you know how they view the world and you don't need to know anymore. You can trust them without even asking who they are. Now it turns out that within our friendships, the more of these, uh, dimensions we have in common with somebody, and these are actual data for, for named individuals within people's social networks. The higher the emotional closeness, the more altruistic we will be towards them, and so on and so forth. So this is a very, very strong bonding effect. Now, the interesting thing about these seven pillars, uh, so if you're a seven, you share seven pillars with somebody, it's a very, very strong relationship. But you can have a one-pillar relationship, and that has offered us the opportunity to build um, uh, much, much larger groupings, which are quite weak, if you like, relatively speaking, compared with friendships. Uh, and what it seems to be especially important in creating that sense of belonging are, we think, origin stories, how we came to be folk tales and folk customs, which is kind of how we do things here, this is our style, and, and particularly the worldview and religion, why the reasons why we do things that are the same. And here, this brings into play uh, in some interesting observations that come from looking at the nature of religions, which very much bear back on, on uh, the pre Andreas's talk, actually. Um, the, one of the problems with all the big religions, if you look at them, is they constantly fragment. Uh, and they fragment because cults and sects constantly bubbling up from below. You can see this in early Christianity, you can see this in medieval Christianity, you can see it in Islam, Judaism, all the big religions. Buddhism, um, Hinduism, and so forth. Um, what characterizes these cults is they're all very small, typically about one to 200 people. They're all built around a charismatic leader. Uh, they all have rather exotic beliefs and practices, and they have a, a, and those exotic beliefs and practices create a deep sense of belonging and commitment to the little group that so gives them immense power. And of course, the big religions don't like them because they're anarchic. Uh, and very difficult to control, and they, uh, most of the big religions spend a lot of time trying to eradicate these, um, particularly in the Abrahamic tradition, uh, eradicate these, these, these cults as they appear. Uh, and of course, sometimes they get away from 
uh, the uh, control of the center, and they give rise to whole new um, uh, um, religions, as in fact Christianity evolved out of Judaism and Protestantism evolved out of Catholicism and so on. So this, this um, uh, the problem basically comes down to the fact that our, our social, we feel much more comfortable in very, very small uh, social worlds. Those social worlds can become extremely tightly bonded and um, ideologically committed, if you like, as a result of that. So these are the exotic beliefs and practices. Um, and then uh, can um, effectively launch uh, uh, iconoclastic revolutions against the uh, central powers. So just to, to sum up, really, the, the main uh, message, takeaway message is so that natural human community sizes are extremely small, much smaller than people think. We can exploit the mechanisms for bonding these communities to create very large one-dimensional religions. But because those relationships are moderately weak, uh, they're, uh, but they're strong enough to create friendships in, in um, uh, uh, inverted commas, if you like, out of complete strangers, commitment to complete strangers and say a big religion. Um, nonetheless, uh, they, um, uh, you know, will allow us to, to create these very big groups. And then the last point, um, these very large communities are very prone to fragmentation and challenge from below. And on that happy note, let me go back to stopping screen sharing. Robin, you say that re real groups are maximum 150 people. I have friends who have 2,357 friends on Facebook. What shall I say to them? I have no friends on Facebook. <laughs> I'm in a bad way. They're in, they're in good shape. The answer is they're doing, if you look at, um, I mean, you, you actually see these numbers beautifully represented even in the digital world, even in telephone uh, phone calling databases, we've shared it. That 150 is the set of people that you have really meaningful relationships with. Beyond that are further circles, which be are a weaker and weaker relationships that you contact less and less until you get to the point where um, you've signed up people who are just voyeurs on pictures of your breakfast uh, that you care to post. Um, and they're really meaningless. And if you look at the traffic on Facebook, you will see, uh, and I'm sure you'll friends. In fact, actually, uh, a, a Swedish TV host actually tested this by checking out every single person on his uh, professional Facebook page and decided that I was probably right, because a lot of them got very cross when he turned up at their house to say, <laughs> I'm here and I, uh, at a very inconvenient time. Um, so, so, you know, you, yes, you, you know, Facebook allows you to have 2,000 uh, friends listed. We have that in real life. We call those acquaintances, people we work with, but we would never invite home to our house, for example, um, and people beyond that. So, um, but Robin, how, how many of these seven pillars can crumble before the bonds break? But that has much more to do with uh, the time you invest in the, in the individual person rather than the seven pillars themselves. The seven pillars themselves are kind of fixed. Or, I mean, they, because they're cultural, they can change through life, but you adjust those according to the in common interests of other, other people. Say so your friends may say, oh, there's a, there's a great new comedian to go and, go and see. Why don't we go and go to the theater tonight? And that, that does allow you, those pillars to change so you converge with your friends a little bit. But by and large, it's all about the time that you devote to your friends that really determines uh, whether that relationship has any assistance through time.